The variety of aircraft types making up USAFE allows it to perform all of the most important tactical air power missions. The EF-111 Raven provides electronic jamming services to blind enemy radar. USAFE's mission is closely integrated with the other NATO air forces. Punch comes from its attack and strike aircraft. Three aircraft types are used in this role, the F-16 fighter bomber and the A-10 tank buster for the close air support role, and the F-111 strike fighter for long-range missions. The long-range offensive arm of USAFE is the General Dynamics F-111 strike fighter, sometimes nicknamed the Aardvark, due to its long, droopy nose. It is a substantially larger aircraft than the F-16 or A-10, and it was designed from the outset to operate in all weather conditions, day or night. An F-111 pilot describes the difference in the mission of these different aircraft. F-111 is an uh, all-weather, uh, night, day, attack, uh, fighter, bomber. What we do, we take our uh, Munitions in low and fast is a primary mission that we have uh, through the weather. Whatever any kind of conditions, that's where we basically like to uh, fly. Keeps us safe. No one else likes to be up there with us and uh, stay out of anybody's eyesight. The F-111 contains a highly sophisticated mixture of features to carry out its missions. The F-111's advanced terrain-following radar allows it to fly at very low altitudes at speeds over 500 miles per hour to better evade enemy radars and radar-guided anti-aircraft missiles. The radar is a particularly useful feature in a European environment, since bad weather often interferes with low-altitude flying. Bad weather can prevent operations by the F-16s and the A-10s. The ultimate version of the F-111 series, the F-111F, is fitted with the Pave Tac Pod, a system which allows the F-111 to use laser-guided bombs to attack targets with pinpoint accuracy. The Pave Tac shoots a beam of invisible laser light at the target. Some of this light is reflected back, and the laser-guided bomb homes in on this reflected light. The Pave Tac also has advantages even when dropping unguided bombs. The laser does two things when we're dropping what we call laser-guided bombs. Number one, it, it updates bomb range, which is very critical when you're dropping a bomb. It's basically a triangle. The one, one leg of the triangle is your altitude above the ground, and you need to know another leg, the hypotenuse, and that is a tricky, tricky equation to solve. Well, if you get that solved, you have mu dropped much better bombs. The laser does that, obviously, because it's very fast, shoots very, very accurate, shoots straight down to the target, you know exactly where it's going, ups updates the system. That's good for bombing, and then once the bomb is released, it's gonna go there because you've got, you've got everything figured out. You've got the right airspeed and everything. The bomb is heading in that direction. Now you're going to make double sure that it goes there. You fire the laser, and then the bomb opens, it, opens its eyes. It has canards on both sides, and then it steers the bomb into the target. It's a very good, very good system. personnel of the 494th Tactical Fighter Squadron based at Lake and Heath, England, the day's work centers around the F-111 aircraft. A machine of this complexity requires about 25 man-hours of work on the ground for every hour it spends in the air. On the landing gear door of each aircraft is the name of its crew chief and assistant crew chief. A tangible reminder of the crucial role played by the ground crew in keeping the aircraft flying. The responsibilities of the, uh, the crew chief and the assistant dedicated crew chief um, basically are to take care of all the, the general maintenance on the aircraft. Um, anything ranging from servicing with gas, oil, um, it requires air servicing, um, liquid oxygen, uh, release point for the weapons uh, on time uh, at the correct parameters and then the weapon system officer he is uh, in our primary delivery modes he will uh, 
get the uh, release the weapons, make sure that they are uh, on uh, the target, that he's monitoring the systems, that uh, we can actually hit the target and take it out at the specified times. Basically, if you want to get right down to the facts, uh, the pilot more or less steers the aircraft, and uh, I tell him which direction to go, and then um, put the radar crosshairs on the target, and then we release the weapons on the target. Uh, and in general terms, he rows the boat, and uh, I shoot the ducks. In view of the sophistication of the F-111, it's not surprising that its cockpit is quite complex. Okay, uh, what we got here is from left to right, we have a, a IFF, which bas basically it does is it gives a radio signal out to uh, air controlling agencies and uh, it tells them who we are. Some other things we have over here, we have the terrain following radar, which allows us, when we turn it on, we do our, do our checks that we have to do. It allows us to follow the, uh, the uh, earth at a preset uh, level, anywhere from 250 to 1,000 feet. Uh, other things, the, what I really like is the uh, pave pack. It's uh, the pod that's underneath. Uh, what it is, it's an infrared detector set, and we use that to uh, find our target. And then when we find our target, we, we fire a laser that's underneath, and we guide bombs that we're carrying into the target so we, we get a pretty precise uh, hit on the target. Very accurate. For much of the attack run, the weapon systems officer will be heads down in the radar display. I try not to spend too much time in there if I, if I don't have to, because uh, the more heads, not, heads down time you have, the less time you have to look for uh, uh, enemies, enemy uh, air interceptors coming in after you. So you try and stay heads out as much as you can. Uh, there's really no, no reason to stay in there too much. The longer I stay in there, the more disoriented I get, because, you know, you, you're, you're down, you're, you're heading the feed bag like this, and he's doing all kinds of wild stuff, and uh, you don't, you come up and you, it takes you a little while to get reoriented, or reorientated, as the Air Force would say, and uh, figure out where you're at. Flying the F-111 under the automatic control of the terrain following radar is a very distinctive feature of this aircraft. The F-111 crews had nicknames for this type of flying, calling it TFing or TFR flight. It's an eye-opener. We don't have to really touch anything. If we have all the autopilots hooked up, I can almost go, almost go to sleep. But uh, we're just monitoring the systems more or less, and the computer gets us to where we're going. Flying TFRs at night are a very eye-opening experience because uh, we can't see anything out in front, but the plane is still maneuvering around and doing whatever it needs to do. But, and all we have to tell what's happening is by the instruments and by the radar screens we have. So we can't see if anything's coming towards us, if we're really going to be hitting anything except by the instruments we have. So we have to be paying a lot of attention to what's going on. In the beginning, it was very, very easy because ignorance is bliss. You really don't know how close you come to dying. But the further and further, the more often you do it, it gets scarier and scarier. You see different friends of yours getting killed and then you'll break out of the clouds every once in a while you look over there'll be a mountain on both sides of your wing you're going holy mackerel this is a good opportunity to bust my tail and uh, it's not easy the terrain following radar makes the f-111 a particularly stable platform for dropping bombs at low altitudes this is like a cadillac when it you're flying low level. It's amazing how smooth it is at, say, 500 feet uh, with, with uh, say, 30 knots of wind, gusting how smooth this is. It's like riding a big old Eldorado, big old 68 Eldorado with leather seats and cruise control on down the highway. That's about what it's like. Uh, but I don't think they don't have anything that could replace it. I, I heard they did a study and basically what they came, so for a jet that replaced 111, what they came up with was another 111 something a little more improved, you know, with a little more uh, agility and better uh, cockpit vision, but basically it's just another 111. The F-111 has a phenomenal payload and can carry over six tons of bombs, including a wide assortment of laser-guided bombs. Even on a long-range mission, the F-111 can carry heavy loads, such as a dozen 500-pound unguided snake-eye bombs or four 2,000-pound laser-guided bombs. 
These days, the F-111s carry electronic defensive pods mounted under the tail of the aircraft to hide themselves from enemy radars by electronic jamming. Under the wings of the F-111s are Sidewinder missiles to defend themselves from enemy fighters. During practice missions over Europe in peacetime, they will sometimes engage in mock dogfights with friendly fighters. Every once in a while, with some of the formations that we fly, we have possibly some aggressor type aircraft that might roll in on a couple airplanes in front of us, and they're kind of, you know, just dead meat, basically. <laughs> I shot down two Mirages yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yeah. In the spring of 1986, after yet another terrorist outrage, the United States decided to retaliate by bombing several military targets in Libya. Washington selected a night air raid, launched from bases in England and carriers in the Mediterranean. The F-111Fs of the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing were the obvious choice for the job, with their unique capabilities and pave tack night bombing system. Codenamed Operation El Dorado Canyon, the mission entailed a grueling 13-hour journey over 5,600 nautical miles in length, requiring four in-flight refueling from the big Yusefi KC-10 and KC-135 aircraft. The F-111 strike fighters from Lakenheath were supported by EF-111 Raven electronic warfare aircraft from the nearby base at Upper Haven. The EF-111s used their powerful electronic jamming equipment to neutralize Libyan radars and radar-directed anti-aircraft weapons. The Navy also took part in the mission, their A-6 intruders having many of the same capabilities as the F-111s. The F-111s were assigned three targets in the Tripoli area, while the Navy's carrier aircraft struck two targets in the Benghazi area. On approaching the Libyan coast in the early morning hours of the 15th of April, 1986, the F-111s used their terrain-following radars to navigate to their targets, the Azazia barracks and the Tripoli airfield. This is an actual tape from the mission showing the radar scan. At close range, the weapon systems officer switched to the paved tack to get a more detailed view, as seen here. The Tripoli airfield was crowded with five large Aleutian IL-76 transport aircraft of the type seen here. This is the view of the weapon systems officer from one of the F-111s attacking Tripoli airfield as a dozen Mark 82 500-pound Snake Eye bombs obliterate the transports. This picture turns upside down as the paved tack slews backwards underneath the aircraft. Out of 88 bombs dropped by the F-111s, only three missed their targets. The raid lasted for less than 20 minutes, and all the targets were left smoldering ruins. One F-111 was lost due to unknown causes. The pilots, weary from a long, tense flight to the target, headed back to their bases in Britain in the pre-dawn hours. With the dramatic political changes that have occurred in Eastern Europe since 1989, the rationale for the United States Air Force's presence in Europe is changing. For five decades, American warplanes have flown alongside those of their NATO allies with a mission of preserving the peace during the tense years of the Cold War. This mission may finally come to an end as tensions between the superpowers diminish. <laughs> 